Welcome back students. In this lecture we're going to look at some of the various different clients that we can use to interact with our database. And the first one is probably the one that we use the least, but it does have some important use cases. We will need it for some functions, so I wanted to at least discuss it. And that is the command line. Now in Windows you can find the command line just by searching for CMD. It's just a command prompt. And there are other ways that you can find it as well, but this is how I usually get to it. And if I click on here, I get a command prompt window. And those of you who are as old as I am probably recognize this. It's almost identical to the old MS-DOS prompt. And I had to interact with computers in this way for almost a decade before Windows even came out. So to, in order to run commands from the command prompt in PostgreSQL, we have to first navigate to the directory where PostgreSQL is stored. And so I'm going to type in cd backslash program files backslash postgresql backslash 10 backslash bin. I think that's right. Looks like it. And if I do a directory of that, see we have a number of executable files in here. Some of these are programs that we can run, as we'll see. The main one that we're going to run now is called PSQL for PostgreSQL. And we also have to pass some options. We have to pass it a username, and the only user that we have right now is Postgres. And we also have to tell it the name of the database that we want to connect to. And that's again sdb underscore course. And then I'll hit return. And here I have my command prompt that lets me know that I'm in the database. And now I can run SQL queries from this command prompt just by typing in a SQL statement. Just like that. And I always have to include a semicolon at the end when I'm using the command prompt. And when I do that, then I start seeing the output of my SQL query. You'll see down here it says more. If I hit return, it gives me the next page more etc. And if I don't want to see any more, I just want to get back to the prompt, I can type the Q key and then I'm back to my prompt. And if you type help from the command prompt, it'll give us some escape sequences that we can use. For instance, I can type backslash H for help with SQL command. So I'll type backslash H and it tells me all the SQL commands that are available. I can also type backslash h and then let's say drop database. And that gives you some information, tells us what that command does, gives us a syntax to use it, and etc. And that command will actually permanently delete a database, so let's not ever do that unless we really, really intend to. Let me type help again. And I can do a backslash question mark to get help with psql commands. And those are not actually part of the SQL language, but they're commands that I can also type here in the psql command prompt. And you can go through and look at some of these on your own if you want. One really useful one is this backslash copy, because that will allow us to copy data from the database, wherever it is, directly to the client. And that's really useful. And the last one, if you want to exit the psql command prompt, you should do a backslash Q and hit return. And then we're done. And there are some other programs, like I said in here, besides psql. For instance, there's a command line program called shape to pgsql that should be installed with PostGIS. And if we just type that, we get a lot of help information, a lot of the options that we actually want to use if we're going to use that. But what that does is it's just a command line program to load data from a shapefile into the PostgreSQL database. We've already seen how to use a graphical user interface to this program. And that's that PostGIS shapefile loader. And one that we will be using on later in the course that doesn't have a graphical user interface or any other way to use it is called raster to pgsql. That's how we load raster data into PostGIS. And as far as I know, this is the only way to do it. So we will have to use a command line at some point. Now, if I close this command line window and open another one, then I'm right back in my default directory. And if I type psql here, I get nothing because I'm not in the directory where, where the psql executable file is stored. But I want to show you a trick. It's really handy. And that is we can add that directory to our path variable 
And that's just an environmental variable that's stored in Windows. It lists a bunch of directories that Windows will search looking for executable programs that you enter into the command prompt. And the way we get to that, in Windows 10 at least, is I'm just going to come down here to my search bar and type env. And have the best match is this one, edit the system environmental variables and control panel. You can also get to this directly from the control panel if you have another version of Windows. But in the control panel, under system properties, you can come down here and click the environmental variables button. And then under system variables, I'm going to click the path variable and then edit. And so this is a list of all the directories on my computer that Windows will search for executable files when I enter the name of a program into the command prompt. And I'm going to add one right here. So I click new and I'm going to type that C colon backslash program files slash postgresql slash 10. That's the version number slash bin and then click OK and I just want to look at that again and make sure I entered it correctly. I think I did. So now that that's in a path variable now I can come back here and type psql and it might not work. I might have to reboot my computer. I'm not 100% sure. Let me just check to see if it'll catch that if I open the command prompt again. Yeah, it does. So I do have to reboot my computer. All I have to do is close that command prompt and open it again and it'll read that path variable in. So now, let me get back to my command prompt. Now it doesn't matter where I am, I can type in psql or psql and my options for a username and the database name. Otherwise it's going to go to the, to the default database which is called Postgres as well. sdb course and now I have my psql prompt. And any of those other programs are shape to sql or sql to shape or raster to sql. I can run those programs as well. So that's just a little trick. If you're not running Windows, if you're on Mac or Linux, hopefully if you're at the level where you're taking a class in spatial databases, you'll also know how to open a shell to get to the command prompt in your operating system and be able to enter commands. Unfortunately, I don't have access to a Macintosh or a Linux computer, so I can't really show you directly how to do that, but it shouldn't be too terribly much different than what it is on Windows once you get to the command prompt. And who knows, maybe if enough people buy my courses and I start making a little bit more money, I'll be able to buy a Macintosh or a Linux computer, and then I'll be able to directly support those platforms as well. So I'm going to close my command prompt. We've already looked a little bit at pgadmin4. This is pretty much just a graphical user interface to the command prompt. Everything that we do in the command prompt, we can do from here. It's just a much nicer interface. So let's go to my SDB course database. It's already expanded here. And to get to the window where I can enter SQL statements, again, I go to Tools and then Query Tool. And this box up here is where I type my SQL. So I can just say select asterisk from bald eagle nests needs to be an underscore. And then click this lightning bar to execute the SQL statement. And the results from that select query show up down here under the data output tab. And we also have a tab called query history. And say, let's go back to the data output. And say I want to do this select now. I want to see the survey results for the, all the bald eagle nests. Remember, this is non-spatial data. I'll execute that query. And we can see that data. And now if I go to my query history tab, I can see a list of all the queries I've ran since I started this instance of pgadmin4. And if I want to go back and run one again, say I want to do nest, I can just copy that right from here, paste it into my SQL box, and execute it. And another really nice thing, but I can modify this easily to add a where clause such as where status equals active nest. I'm not sure if that's going to run or not, but I think it will. Nope, I don't have a status field. Anyhow, it's just a matter of changing this field name. So the query history is really handy. I think you'll find yourself using that a lot if you use this pgadmin4. Now, unfortunately, in pgadmin4, all you can see is the data. You can't see the spatial representation of the geometry. So if I go back to bald eagle nests and run this query, see we have a geometry field called geom, 
and it just has a gibberish of numbers. And that's because this is a binary large object field. It just has binary data. And this is a textual representation of that binary data, but it's not something that humans can read. So we can see that we have some geometry, but we can't actually see what, exactly what that geometry means. To do that, we have to look at this data through another client, and that's going to be a desktop GIS. So let's go to QGIS, and I'm just going to remove, actually I'll leave these in. We have Great Blue Heron Rookeries, Linear Projects, and Raptor Nests. So in QGIS, enter a SQL query against this data. I'll go to the DB Manager. I'm going to navigate to our database, the public schema, and then I'm going to click this button right here, which if I hover over it, I get a tooltip that says it's a SQL window. And so now I have a SQL window similar to, actually I'm going to expand this to make it a little bit bigger, similar to what we had in pgadmin4. We have a box up here where I can type in a SQL command. Now I have an execute button here that I'm going to click. And once I do that, I see the same information down here, just like we had in pgadmin. Now I don't have a query history here, but I do have the option to save this query. So I can just give it a name, all underscore bald eagle nests, and I'll click store, and then change this to bald eagle surveys, I'll execute that one. But then all I want to do if I want to execute one that I've already named is come here to my drop down list, pick the query I want to do, and it enters that back in there, and I can execute it again. So that's really handy. So if there's a query that we use a lot, we can save it and retrieve it again. Now something else that we can do is we can actually see the spatial representation of this data. And I'll do that by clicking this box where it's load as a new layer. And when I do that, I'll have some options. One option, I have to tell it which column the geometry is in. And then I'm going to give it a layer name. Just call it bald eagle nests. And then I click load now. And now I should, if I reduce this, yeah. Now I have a bald eagle nest layer. And to make those nests a little bit easier to see by making them a big red dot. So those are all my bald eagle nests. And this is all based on a SQL query against the database. Now I just wanted to show you also that you can view this PostGIS data in ArcGIS as well. So let's go to ArcGIS and under the file menu, and I'm in ArcGIS 10.4, I know 10.5 is out, I haven't installed it yet. But under the file menu, under add data, we have an option to add a query layer. And that's what we're going to do. And I already have a connection set up, it's called connection to localhost. And if I click that, I see all the tables that I have in my PostGIS database. Now you probably won't have that, but if you click connections and new, you can create a new connection with the same information that we have to enter for all our connections. And that's the host name. It's called instance in this dialog box. Username and password and the database. Anyhow, let's put in, say, Raptor Nest. And so as soon as I double click on that, we see a list of all the fields that are available. And it automatically creates a select query for us. We just have to give it a name. And that name's going to be Bald Eagle Nest again. If I want to double check again before I run it that it's a valid query, I can click the validate box. And as soon as I do that, then this next option becomes enabled. And so I'll click that. It's asking me to pick the unique identifier field. So I'm going to go with ID. It finds the geometry type, etc. And then I'll click finish. And it does some calculations to find the extent of the layer. And there's all my Raptor Nest data. And once it's in ArcGIS like this, I can do almost anything I want to do with it. I can look at the attribute table, could join it to some other data, I could use it as input to any kind of geoprocessing tool. The one thing I can't do is edit it in ArcGIS. I can't edit this PostGIS data in ArcGIS. And depending on your needs, that might be a problem, or it might not. But it does raise a potential for an interesting use case where you have a large project where you have 10 or 15 or 20 people that need to get in and add data and edit data. And you have another couple people who are project managers or GIS analysts who just need to analyze that data or view it in a map. 
And those people can have access to ArcGIS if they really want to use ArcGIS tools on that data. But those 15 or 20 people that need to edit the data can do all the editing in QGIS. And as you'll see, QGIS works just fine. In fact, I find that I much prefer the editing tools in QGIS than I do the ones in ArcGIS. But they can do all the editing in QGIS and more advanced users if they want. And that, I actually think that the analysis tools in QGIS are fine as well. But some people are going to be more familiar with what's available in ArcGIS. Uh, the analysis tools, or if they're more familiar with the cartography tools in ArcGIS, they can do anything they want to do with data from PostGIS other than edit it. So thanks for listening. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about how data is organized in a spatial database. We'll talk about what a database is and what a schema is and what a table is, etc. And we'll see you then.